Hello and welcome to the City of Peoria Planning and Zoning Commission. The Planning and Zoning Commission is composed of volunteer citizens appointed by the City Council. The Commission is the designated hearing body for a range of land use applications, including general plan amendments, rezones, conditional use permits, and amendments to the Zoning Code. Upon recommendation by the Commission, general plan amendments, rezones, and Zoning Code amendments proceed forward to the Peoria City Council for final action. For conditional use permits, the Commission will make a final decision subject to appeal. All hearings are conducted in accordance with the rules for procedure requirements to allow an impartial and efficient hearing, and all Commission meetings are open to the public under the Arizona Open Meeting Law. Each case will be called in the order in which it appears on the agenda unless otherwise announced during the meeting. Once called, city staff will give a presentation of the case, followed by a presentation from the applicant if they so desire. After the applicant's presentation, members of the public who have submitted a speaker's request form will be called to speak by the commission chair. The applicant may be called to provide additional information, clarification, or a rebuttal. The commission will discuss the case, may ask additional questions, and take action. Any member of the public wishing to speak must complete a speaker's request form and hand it to the planning assistant at the end of the dais. When speaking, please limit your comments to a maximum of three minutes and try not to repeat statements already made by others. We welcome your comments and as fellow citizens of Peoria, we thank you in advance for your participation. All right, good evening. I'd like to open this planning and zoning meeting tonight, uh, June 2nd, 2022. My name is Clay Alsop. Thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate your participation. Uh, we'll start off tonight's meeting with a roll call. Commissioner or Vice Chair Fighter. Present. Secretary Linda Grice. Present. Uh, Commissioner Sean Hutchinson. Present. Commissioner Jeff Nelson. Present. Commissioner Josephine Waitman. Present. We do have one vacant seat and uh, chair is present. And we'll proceed to the consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed by the commission will be enacted in one motion. Do I have a motion for the consent agenda items 1C and 2C? Chair, I move that we uh, approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll second. Thank you, please vote. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. I will proceed to item 3R. Um, are we gonna be doing 3R and 4R together or separate presentations? So we'll do the presentation for 3R and 4R together. Staff, please present your report. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, members of the commission. My name is Chris Jasper, forgive my out of breathness. Oh. Try not to faint. Uh, I had a bit of a jog earlier. Um, I will, I'm the planner assigned to these cases, uh, which are uh, a general plan amendment request and rezone request for the development known as Modern Park West. As noted, these are two separate actions which will be taken at the end of the, uh, uh, the presentation. Uh, but for the sake of brevity, uh, both items will be presented at once. Brief overview of the project. The applicant is David Shusheski, uh, who is uh, applying on behalf of Modern Apartments, which is the developer on the uh, development. Uh, is located generally at the northeast, northeast of the northeast corner of 95th Avenue and Olive Avenue. The project is, a, or the subject site is approximately 5.7 gross acres in area. And uh, as discussed, the proposal is to uh, modify the general plan land use category and rezone the property to develop a 130 unit apartment complex. More specifically, the general plan amendment would amend the land use category from the existing designation of commercial to the urban residential land use category, which accommodates densities of 12 plus dwelling units per acre. And the rezone case would rezone the property from the existing planned neighborhood commercial or PC1 zoning district to the modern Park West planned area development. And a quick refresher, 
uh, PAD or planned area development is a tailored zoning district to address a site's uh, unique conditions. Subject site is currently undeveloped, vacant, um, just northeast of an existing Circle K gas station. It is generally surrounded by single family residential to the north and the east, uh, more specifically by the Moreland Estates subdivision. To the south and southeast is the uh, aforementioned Circle K gas station across Olive Avenue to the south are large lot single family residential homes, and to the west is a religious use facility, a church, and uh, single family residential developments in the New River Ranch subdivision. Broadly, uh, the area is within a quarter mile of the Loop 101 freeway. It's approximately one quarter mile to the west. Um, as you can see, there's a mix of densities and uses uh, in the area, including the flats, which is a multifamily apartment complex past or further west of the uh, church site. Uh, not pictured on the vacant uh, property to the southwest is the Bella uh, Olivia project, which is a 130 unit condominium uh, development, which is currently under construction. So that's why it's not uh, pictured in this image. Uh, 95th Avenue is a collector street, which runs north up to Peoria Avenue, and Olive Avenue is an east-west arterial street. Uh, getting into the history on the subject site, it was annexed into the city in 1980 and was uh, shortly thereafter rezoned from the holding agricultural designation to uh, its current zoning designation, which is PC1 Planned Neighborhood Commercial. At the time of its development, it was contemplated as a quote unquote traditional retail uh, area, uh, but residents at the time requested that it have a limited uh, frontage along Olive Avenue. Uh, which we'll discuss a little bit more in a uh, subsequent slide. The existing Circle K gas station was approved through a conditional use permit in 1999 and then developed in late 2000 to early 2001, which is how we have arrived at the current site configuration. Uh, I know this is the second time in as many meetings that I have presented on a proposal that involves a commercial uh, current the commercially zoned parcel uh, being proposed for residential uses. Um, as always, staff evaluates any uh, change in land use uh, for the uh, uh, viability of uh, you know, commercial development on that parcel. Um, and there are a number of impairments existing on the site that have led staff to generally believe that the location of the subject site as currently constituted is unlikely to attract what we would refer to as a major anchor or magnet user, which is the intended development pattern associated with our PC1 or planned uh, neighborhood commercial zoning district. One of those impairments is the, sub, uh, the site size. It's approximately 5.7 gross acres and is you know, developable as about five to 5.5 net acres. Um, and it's got that irregular configuration, which limits the sort of developable land, especially when you calculate in factors such as drive aisles, uh, drive, excuse, excuse me, parking stalls, landscape islands, landscape buffers, building setbacks, et cetera. It has a limited vehicular access from Olive Avenue, which is the primary arterial, which runs east to west from the Loop 101. There is an existing driveway onto the Circle K site. However, no dedicated shared access easement was provided at the time of development, so access onto the site is not guaranteed. An access point from 95th Avenue um, uh, is less than ideal, as 95th Avenue uh, represents, is a uh, collector uh, roadway, as classified by the City of Peoria Circulation Plan which features lower volumes and lower vehicular through uh, output, excuse me. And there are visibility concerns related to the existing gas station. Um, any building that would be likely to develop on the site would most likely be forced to be located further north in order to accommodate the required site improvements, which limits its visibility along Olive Avenue. In addition, um, Development, uh, the site, excuse me, was uh, designated for commercial development prior to the construction of the Loop 101 freeway. Uh, since that freeway's construction, uh, the majority or uh, most meaningful commercial development has occurred 
to the east side, and some of these outlying commercial pieces have been um, sort of left over from that initial zoning time. Getting into the actual development plan, uh, as noted before, 130 units are proposed on the roughly 5.7 gross acre site, resulting in a density of about 22.9 dwelling units per acre. Um, some of the amenities proposed as part of the site plan package, uh, which is included in the rezoning narrative in your agenda uh, packet, include a clubhouse, a central amenity area with a pool, a fitness center, um, there is a dog park and dog wash facility provided, uh, barbecue nodes sprinkled throughout the site, and bike storage and repair facilities. There's a better, more zoomed in look at the development plan. There are 15 buildings uh, proposed on the site, which are made up of a mix of two-story buildings that are highlighted in blue on the graphic on the uh, slideshow and three-story buildings which are highlighted in green. Uh, there's a mix of studio, one bedroom, and two bedroom units, which make up uh, 18, 54, and 28% respectively of the unit mix. Um, I'll also note that the applicant has proposed to locate the two-story carriage unit building, which is located, excuse me, uh, in, uh, adjacent to the amenity area, kind of on the north side of the property, uh, closest to the single-family residential uses to the east. Uh, getting into some of the traffic-related access and improvements, uh, the primary access onto the site will be provided on 95th Avenue, which will allow full turning movements into and out of the subject site. Emergency access only will be provided onto Olive Avenue, uh, meaning there will not be any permitted ingress or egress unless for uh, emergency-related reasons. And no access will be permitted onto Mission Lane to the north. Both of the... Uh, access points will be gated, and a pedestrian gates will be provided on both. Additionally, the uh, developer will provide half street improvements on both Mission Lane and 95th Avenue. In accordance with the requirements of the City of Peoria Zoning Ordinance, a notice of application and a notice of hearing postcard was mailed to all property owners within a 600-foot radius of the property and all registered HOAs within a one mile radius. A legal ad was published in a newspaper of record and the site was posted physically with a sign uh, in accordance with city requirements. Uh, staff has been in communication with the school district, Peoria Unified School District, and they have indicated that the school district does have the ability to serve the development. All land use changes or rezone and uh, minor general plan amendment cases are required to uh, conduct a citizen participation plan or process and as such the developer or the applicant excuse me was required to notice and then host a neighborhood meeting that neighborhood meeting was held on november 29th in 2021 at the residence inn uh, at which nine residents were in attendance in addition to members of the project team city staff and the district council member Topics of concerns that were noted at that meeting include the proposed heights of the building and its compatibility with the adjacent single family residential neighborhoods, the impact of traffic generated by the project on 95th Avenue in particular and noise generated on the development. The applicant hosted a second neighborhood meeting on March 17th in 2022 at the same location at which five residents were in attendance in addition to members of the project team and city staff and uh, residents uh, reiterated their concern related to building height, uh, specifically the sight lines from the second and third stories, the proximity of the buildings or the proposed buildings to uh, single family residential homes, and um, additional traffic generated by the development, specifically on 95th and Olive Avenue. Uh, at the meeting, residents also stated a preference for um, commercial uses on the subject site, such as restaurants. As of 4 p.m. today, uh, because there were some uh, uh, letters of opposition that were walked in uh, earlier this uh, earlier today, uh, we have received nine letters of opposition and one letter of support. Uh, the topics of uh, concern indicated in the letters of opposition are kind of repeated from the uh, neighborhood meeting topics of concern. Uh, 
They relate to the compatibility of the use with the adjacent single family residential products and uh, traffic onto 95th and Olive Avenue. Uh, the one letter of support did indicate uh, interest in a wait list to uh, get an apartment unit. Uh, so based on staff's evaluation, uh, some of the key findings associated with the case um, are that the existing site and its constraints uh, represent sort of impairments for future meaningful commercial viability. Uh, the proposed modification uh, advances the general plan goals for a diversity of housing and opportunities to live near services and employment opportunities. Uh, it provides for a land use transition between commercial uses and established neighborhoods and the proposed housing product is in alignment with the urban residential land use category. As such, staff recommends approval of case GPA 2104 to the City Council. It's the minor general plan amendment. And staff recommends approval of the rezone request case 2107. Subject to the conditions of approval in Exhibit 1. Uh, this concludes uh, my presentation, and I'm available should you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate the presentation. Uh, commissioners, any questions for staff? Commissioner Nelson. More clarification on the PC1 zoning designation. I guess I understood a little differently. It's for small retail uses. You would you spoke of an anchor. It would typically require an anchor store or anchor tenant of some sort. Can you elaborate a little more? Maybe provide some examples around the city of PC1, if you know of any. Or Chris can take that one. <laughs> Excuse me. I mean, Mr. Chair, members off. of the commission, Commissioner Nelson. The uh, PC1 district, when we think about the uh, different, we have about seven commercial districts. The PC1 is a um, rarely used district. I, I don't think there is but a small handful of sites around the city. It's essentially a lower intense type of commercial district. Um, the comments we were making in reference to the um, magnet user or some type of anchor, when we look at the uh, commercial viability, and, and we always look at those very carefully, um, we note that um, the property was zoned commercial back in 1981. Um, since that time, the Circle K, fortunately or unfortunately, took the hard corner, and what that left was um, very little frontage along Olive Avenue, which is where all the traffic uh, goes through. And so that left uh, very little frontage on Olive and very little visibility. And what we have left is about a five acre, net five acre site. There isn't a lot that can go there. So when we think about the viability, and we, we set aside the fact that after that time period, the 101 build, and that's really consumed a lot of the um, interest in terms of commercial and employment use along with Westgate. So we talk about some of those residual commercial uses. And uh, uh, given some of these constraints and given the, that with a five acre site, it's really hard to bring in the type of uh, user that might um, generate that sustained commercial activity. Um, I, I suppose you could have some minor commercial activity that, that could occur, but over the last 41 years, the site has been zoned commercial and we just haven't seen the interest. So just for clarification, this would be what I would see as a typical small strip shopping center, for lack of a better term, where you'd have small stores uh, within there, maybe a barber shop, um, tax office, you know, um, for new tax returns. I'm trying to envision what we're talking about. Is that the kind of thing we're Yeah, talking? Commissioner Nelson, members that of the commission. That would be allowable? Okay. Yeah, the type of uses, you're absolutely right. I mean, you could have uh, office, you could have uh, small retail. I believe, well, I believe some restaurants are allowed in that restaurants zone district well? too, but okay. it's along the lower side scale of intensity for commercial. Oh, I see, okay. Coffee shop? Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Commissioner Fighter. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hawkins, the, the current zoning, does it allow for access points off of a non-major arterial for commercial access? Uh, members of the commission, Commissioner Fighter. so d regardless of whether this uh, project was commercial or residential, my understanding is that we would not permit any access off of Olive Avenue, g g given that uh, length. So it would have to come off of, of 95th Avenue. Okay, so whether it's commercial or multifamily access points coming off of... Off 95th, of off of, that's correct. Off of 95th, okay. 
Um, and then this, the current the current site plan has just an emergency exit out onto Olive. Is That's that, correct. That's right. Okay. Commissioner Nelson. Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Mr. Fighter. Can I ask a follow-up to that? So if the, the owner was able to negotiate a access agreement with the Circle K, would that no longer be an issue? Would then they have access off of Olive Avenue? Commissioner Nelson, I'm going to turn to our traffic engineer over here. <laughs> so. Chair Alsop and Commissioner Nelson, it, it may be easier if it's possible to go to the site plan. Um, that way, we're talking from the same graphic. Okay, it, can you guys see that one, uh, that site plan? Okay. And so, uh, if, regardless of what development comes in here, right now it's proposed um, apartments, say if it's commercial, uh, the access to all of is problematic uh, for a number of reasons. Even cross access and sharing it with Circle K, we wouldn't support as far as traffic because the Circle K driveway is too close to the traffic signal at 95th Avenue and Olive, and it's full access. And so I don't want additional trips coming in and out of that driveway so close to a traffic signal. And if that Circle K was to come in today, they would not be allowed that access, but their grandfather had been there for some time. New development as they come in, especially the frontage that's currently along Olive, it's too, again, too close to the traffic signal and too close to the existing driveway for Circle K. Therefore, we will only permit uh, emergency-only access to allow fire to access this complex off Olive. But any other development, their sole access will come from 95th Avenue, and that's for safety. Uh, Olive has too much traffic on it to provide another full access, and we want to not congest that traffic signal anymore at 95th Avenue and Olive. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Fighter. I'm sorry, I think Commissioner Nelson and I are on the, on the same, we're going back on the same issue, but I think um, my concern is, is that for commercial viability for this, for this site to not have access on a major arterial, I think just really hampen, you know, hampens the, the, the viability of, of commercial for this, for this site without having access point, which it sounds like you're stuck with 95th Avenue anyways. Okay, thank you. Well, I think a key takeaway for me is, you know, looking at the case last month, looking at this one, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be applying a higher level of scrutiny to any gas station that wants to locate on a C2 parcel, and it's going to reduce frontage, you know, visibility, frontage visibility, access, whatever it may be. I'm looking at through a whole new lens going forward, more a comment than a question, but, you know, that, that's concerning that we, that we as a city would have allowed that knowing we then predetermined predetermine that fate of that piece by doing that and took a piece of commercial potentially out of the queue. So again, just an editorial comment there, but uh, it's concerning. What's, uh, I had a question, um, I, I, maybe, maybe you said it in your report and I missed it. When did that Circle K go in? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Commission. Uh, so that, Circle K uh, was approved through a conditional use permit in 1999, and I believe was constructed in 2001. Okay, yeah. right. For those that have been around long enough, remember, remember it's at vacant for a few years before they actually actually opened it, so. Yeah, my, my reason in asking, you know, I, I wonder you know, if the Nexus, uh, when the commission or whoever saw this in 1999, you know, Olive Avenue was substantially different at that point. Um, traffic patterns, but certainly lessons learned. Um, I think this is a very different case than what we were looking at a month ago. Um, some similarities, but different enough for me to be able to consider in a different way. Uh, Commissioner Waitman. Absolutely, I have a few questions. Is the, is the applicant um, present today? Okay, they may speak, but um, my question, and I think um, my fellow commissioners may know, they have a little bit more experience, but with the access point being off 95th, because I had a chance to kind of drive around and I just went on Mission Lane and I kind of wanted to see what it looked like, also trying to see it from a resident's point of view. So with the access point being um, on 95th, will the main signage also be on 95th Avenue to where there's not really any visibility from Olive? If that makes sense. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, Commissioner. I uh, believe that level of review will be uh, conducted on the site plan level. 
Um, I'm not sure exactly based on the information that has been provided thus far. Okay, thank you. The reason why, of course, I'm looking at this from a resident standpoint and then also for it to be able to be marketable, people wanting to move in, if it's blocked by a Circle K and the only thing you see is the buildings, you don't know what's behind there, possibly pretty hard to find. So I just kind of want to know where the signage would be because, yes, um, of course, we don't want to conge congest Olive and it, it's probably a safety issue, but usually when some of these commercial properties and these multi-family properties get built, they do have an access point that is straight off of that main road, which, 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 which I'm used to seeing. So I just want to know where that signage would be, but I'm a little bit ahead, I see. Okay. Any other comments from commission? Commissioner Grace. I have a couple of a couple of comments on this, you know, with the uh, developer that chose to put it in a use that diminished the value of the remaining property. I don't feel like the city should have to be responsible for helping them recover for their poor decisions, um, and I think it's put by allowing these types of uses, it puts the burden on the city to figure out a way to make it work. Um, that's a comment. Secondly, I, might, I would like to know about the density here. The surrounding uses are like five to 12 acres or tw five to 12 dwelling units per acre, uh, one dwelling unit per acre, two to five. So we're looking at modifying the general plan or amending the general plan to allow 12 dwelling units per acre but then when we go to the zoning case, we're now talking about 23 dwelling units per acre. I'm a little uh, at a loss as how we make that jump. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Chair, members of the commission. Um, the general plan land use category is uh, the, uh, I think, broader, uh, well, actually, I don't wanna butcher this explanation. <laughs> Maybe I should let Sure. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the land use designation that the applicant is seeking is, uh, is urban residential, which is 12 units and above. The actual density that they're proposing is part of the rezone case, I believe, Chris, was 22 point something is what they're proposing. But the, the designation is 12 units and above. That's the general plan designation. Uh, additional comment from, from me, a question. When the Circle K went in, was uh, I'm assuming that it conformed to existing zoning. So really, it just it was a, a staff approval and never went through a commission or city council. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, members of the commission. So um, I think we mentioned that, that zoning's been in place since 1981. So in 1999, the Circle K, they would have had to get a conditional use permit, which would have come to the commission. But, but it would be it's allowed under the zoning. And just remember, our, our design standards do change. Our access um, consideration standards have likely changed since that point. I think uh, the um, traffic engineer noted that, you know, if development came in today, we would not permit an access point that close to the intersection. Likely, it'd have to be further east, if at all, along Olive Avenue. So, so standards do change and evolve over time. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Waitman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I totally forgot to ask. We had two meetings, outreach. I did go and check the signage. It was very legible. Um, did we do outreach to the church? Uh, thank you, Chair, members of the commission. Um, the church property would have been within the 600-foot uh, radius of the required uh, notification area. So uh, that's, the city sends out a notice of application card to all property and property owners within 600 feet of the subject site and at the time of application and prior to the public hearing this evening. And the uh, church property would have been within that radius. Okay, they did just not reach out. I did take some driving and I seen it was a pretty decent sized church, so I didn't know if they had any input. And then just for clarification, there was outreach done to the school board, um, the school board district, the school district um, locally and they were in support or did they, did they voice their opinion? Uh, yes, thank you for the question, Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, I spoke verbally with a representative from the Pure Unified School District and they indicated that there were no concerns associated with the capacity of the school district uh, with respect to the subject site. 
Okay, so they could accommodate um, this property. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Any further questions or comments from the commission? Commissioner Grace. Going back to my density, uh, what is the designation below 12 plus? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair uh, Commissioner Grice. Um, the land use category that is, I guess, one step less dense than the urban residential land use category would be suburban residential, which uh, is a density range of approximately five to 12 dwelling units per acre. All right, seeing no other comments, um, is the applicant present? Would they like to address the commission? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. David Krzyzewski, for your record, my address is 11811 North Tatum, Suite 1051, Phoenix, Arizona. Here on behalf of the Howard family as an owner of the property and Modern Apartments as the developer. Uh, in addition to myself, I do have Ms. Amber Lauer, who's the Chief Operating Officer for Modern Apartments here to answer any questions you may have specific to the operation, the leasing, management, so forth of the proposed development. We also do have our traffic engineer here because through our outreach with the community, working with staff over the last uh, 14, 15 months, we know traffic is a concern here. So again, I uh, wanted to make sure we're here uh, and able to answer your questions. Before I get into specifics and, and talking about details of the development, I do want to add a little bit more historical context here because as you all noted through your questions, and Chris did a great job talking about the history of this, but one of the things that stands out um, in this is again the orientation of the property, its location on Olive, and again now, you know, proximity to the Loop 101. Again, when this was originally zoned 40 odd years ago, it was planned as sort of a neighborhood uh, retail center. As Commissioner Nelson pointed out, you know, perhaps what we would all refer to as strip retail and having a variety of uses. Obviously, that never developed. I mean, as Chris mentioned, Circle K came in. I think it was actually Phillips 66 at the time in 1999 for a conditional use permit, ultimately built a couple years later. There was a 20-year span in there when, you know, as this area developed, still no, not much commercial activity on this. My clients own the property now for 20-odd years, has had it listed with... Uh, numerous retail commercial brokerage firms uh, has had commercial interest on it. Nothing has ever come to fruition. Uh, more recently, we had interest for uh, townhome type developments, single family detached developments. Again, neither of those uh, move forward uh, through fruition, largely because of development constraints, access constraints, and really orientation and proximity of the property to the gas station. Um, you know, in terms of use, and there's been a couple comments already about compatibility, I just wanted to touch on, you know, again, the position of the property relative to the single family residential that developed around it uh, to the north and to the east, the, the church to the west, and again, Olive, really creates some significant development challenges for a commercial use. Uh, as was discussed, you know, uh, at length already here, the very limited frontage on Olive and the affirmative, you know, no access on Olive really presents almost insurmountable challenges for commercial. Again, all the commercial traffic would have to go down 95th Avenue, enter into the development. Uh, I think Commissioner Nelson mentioned in terms of design and use, you know, under PC1, we could do about a 30% lot coverage for commercial. So you'd be looking at, you know, a, you could put a 70,000 square foot retail center on here, assuming you could park it and do some other things. Uh, again, pad viability, you know, having restaurants uh, behind the Circle K, accessing off of 95th, all these things, as Chris kind of mentioned, really create not only constraints on commercial viability, but significant increases in impact to the existing single family that lives around there and accesses all via 95th Avenue. So in taking all that into consideration over the years, trying to you know, come up with viable commercial developments, alternative uses for this site. What we bring forward to you today, we believe is a very viable project. We believe it is very compatible with the adjoining residential uses. 
uh, and will really complement this area and finally, after 40 odd years, bring this property into a, a very productive and a very quality use. Um, in terms of community outreach, I did want to point out, uh, while it was noted we had several community meetings, but we started much, much earlier than that. My client actually went out uh, meeting with the council member, actually going door to door to some of these residents, just knocking even before we started the development process back in early 2021, just to kind of solicit some community input. What would your thoughts be about a multifamily development here? Again, while we were required to host one neighborhood meeting, which we did, uh, in March of uh, 21, we wound up doing an additional neighborhood meeting and additional door-to-door -door outreach on this. So there's been very good interactive communication here. Now, I will tell you that we mailed out over 160 notices. We reached out to 17 or 18 HOAs within the area, as well as the school district, the church, uh, SRP, other governmental entities here. As Chris noted at our first neighborhood meeting, we had less than 10 residents show up, and most of them lived to the immediate east. At our second neighborhood meeting, we had five show up. And we'll talk about some of the concerns and some of the things we've done, but I wanted to just make a point again that knowing the, the type of project we're bringing forward, the change from commercial to residential, and the history of modern apartments as a developer had, we wanted to make sure we did some early commercial uh, early community outreach to ensure we're soliciting comments and get the community involved. In terms of the proposed development, again, I'll go through this quickly because Chris did a great job and I'll just try to touch on a few points. Again, we're proposing a 130 unit apartment development. It'll be a series of uh, studio apartments, one bedroom and two bedroom apartments. It is appropriately parked. We're slightly over the required parking amount. I think we're required 215 and we're about 217 or 218. In addition to the, uh, the buildings you see here, a little bit hard to see, but there is a carriage unit building uh, toward the east, just to the immediate east of the pool. Um, and that will feature two units above uh, garages. Uh, again, carriage units have become common in apartment developments. They're, they're a special type unit and a lot of people like those. The buildings we're proposing, again, are a combination of single story for the leasing office in the community center, two story for the carriage units, a two story apartment building, and then three story buildings. Again, knowing the context of the area and the positioning of the, of the buildings, we wanted to make sure we tailored the site plan. And so this site plan has gone through various iterations over the past 14 months uh, in moving buildings around, making sure there was ample separation from the buildings to the existing residential, ensuring buffers are in place. The units that are being proposed here, because we've had uh, comments from the community on what type of units, what's the finish, what other you know, rents and the quality of the units, viable concern. Again, the units here are very nicely appointed. Quartz countertops, designer lighting, uh, private balconies. These are, these are intended to be very class A apartments. As Chris noted, the apartment development is a gated community. Again, intended to raise up a bit of a level here in terms of access, provide additional security, not only for the residents there, but also for the community itself. One of the things we worked very closely on, and again, sensitivity to the adjoining uh, single family residential was the concept of open space and buffer. Through the iterations of the site plan here, we knew we had to provide just under 25,000 uh, square feet of uh, open space, usable open space. Where we are today, the plan in front of you is just short of 36,000. So we're more than 40% more than required. And again, that open space really encompasses everything you see in the middle, the pool area where we offer amenities for cabanas, barbecue seating, outdoor lounge areas, uh, a small trail system meandering through the development, the dog park, other sitting and gathering nodes throughout the community to really make this not only apartment development, but a really quality living environment uh, for the tenants. Go back one slide. In addition, let me see here. I did want to point out one thing here, and it was touched on briefly about uh, 95th Avenue and Mission Lane. If those of you, and I think Commissioner Waitman said she had been out there, if you notice as you go north on 95th Avenue, the right-hand side of the road, there's a big striped area there uh, that's really kind of a shoulder and just goes off into the undeveloped property, and the same on Mission Lane. So as part of this project, 
that right away is now going to get dedicated i think you noticed on the early slides you have that kind of an odd leg of the property coming down past the circle k that will get dedicated to the city 95th avenue will be fully improved so the eastern half street will get done as well as the southern half street on mission lane and again you know, in dealing with traffic issues and concerns about stacking and volume of cars coming in and out, these kind of infrastructure improvements have been, you know, waiting to be done now for 40 odd years. We'll finally get them with this project, which again, not only is a benefit to the project, but I think a very good benefit to the overall community around in the area. Back up here a couple, going the wrong way. Apologies. Is this not working? There we go. I was trying to go backwards. Uh, let's go back to like 12, 13. That's fine. So again, in, in summary, we want to present, you know, a project that we think has been very thoughtfully designed, very sensitive to the adjoining uh, single family residential. We are providing a quality environment. We are supporting uh, the goals of smart growth goals outlined in the general plan by bringing in a new and more diverse housing opportunity to the community. We believe in terms of compatibility, this use is significantly more compatible to the existing single family residential to the east and to the north than would be uh, a commercial development or an office development at this, at this location. The traffic volumes that this will generate as as uh, city staff has indicated through our work with them and our own traffic engineers are significantly less than would be generated by current uh, commercial developments that are available on the order of three or four times less than what a commercial development would bring here. Again, the constraints of the narrow frontage on Olive and limited if non-existent access on Olive really presents unique uh, and very special uh, hardships, if you will, on the property for its current zoning district to be uh, a viable use. Go back one more. Again, we think this will finally place this property into a very productive use. As I mentioned, we have gone to links and through various site plan iterations, trying to be very sensitive to comments from the neighbors, adding in a large landscape buffer along the eastern property line, moving the buildings to over 100 feet away from the existing residences to the east. Again, that landscape buffer you see on the, on the east is a 20-foot wide landscape buffer. There are over 50 trees uh, planted in there. Those will be large mature trees. They're gonna be nine to 12 feet at planting and will ultimately grow to 20 or 30 feet because of the species. So we'll create a very nice visual buffer for the project as well as for the adjoining community. Similarly on Mission Lane, as that road improvement gets done, a large landscape buffer to the homes to the north up there. Again, our central entrance will be off of 95th Avenue. And to Commissioner Waitman's comment, that will be the main point in terms of advertisement, if you will, and signage will be at that, at that central entrance. Really probably is more problematic than uh, helpful to have a sign on Olive because we would not want cars trying to make an ingress movement into that drive and causing more traffic. So again, the flow of traffic will be in and out of that drive on uh, 95th Avenue. So again, in summary, we do believe that over the past 14 months, we have worked well with staff incorporating their comments, their request for traffic mitigation measures, development mitigation uh, measures, really redesign of the building, the landscaping. Uh, we believe we have been sensitive to the comments we've received from the neighbors. And we do believe this project will be a great asset to the area and the community. And again, offering a new and more diverse housing opportunity in a, in a market uh, that is really demanding housing opportunities right now. So with that, we would certainly appreciate your support this evening, and I would be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for the applicant? Commissioner Hutchinson. Thanks, Chair. Um, any uh, comments on uh, affordability? Um, they seem like really nice places. You know, again, uh, and I'll just answer the anticipated question in terms of rents. Um, you know, if it, while this project is, you know, a year or more out from being uh, finished and available, if this was open today, we would be looking at rents probably in the $1,500 to $2,100 range. Uh, 
you know, again, certainly more affordable uh, than a lot of areas, certainly more affordable than having to go buy a house in today's market. Uh, so again, we intend to be attracting, again, with the mix of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms at that price point, you know, a pretty broad section of folks, young working professionals, uh, maybe young married couples, could be empty nesters who have now sold their house. I still want a place in, uh, in the Phoenix metro area to come in the winter. And, and so again, with the amenities that are offered here, this creates a very quality living environment for that, that price point. One other question, Chief? Um, the species of the trees on the uh, on the border, especially with the neighbors. Um, any ideas as far as I mean, I've I've seen them where they're, the trees make more of a mess than they're than they're worth. Uh, we got to be looking at you know a, a decent tree that's going to not dump a bunch of garbage in the neighbors' yards. So, uh, Commissioner Hutchinson, what is shown on our landscape plan now, and I think included in your packet, we're calling out a couple of different species of uh, there's a Texas olive tree, there's an evergreen elm that is being used. Again, they were picked by the landscape architect more for sort of the, the, the thickness, the bushiness, if you will, and the ability to grow high. So we do create a good buffer between the development and the existing single family. Thank you. Any other commissioners? All right, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, we do have a few uh, speaker request forms from members of the public. Uh, I will read those off in the order I received them. Uh, when you address the commission, please state your name and address for the record, and we would appreciate you limiting your comments to three minutes. We will start with David Dura. Hey, uh, hi. My name is David Dara. I live at 9351 West Sunny Slope Lane. I've had my house since 1985. I remember when 91st Avenue in Olive was a four-way stop. It was before the 101 was there. I've lived in this area for a long time, actually in this whole area since 1980. I realize this is an odd situation here. We've got the, the landscape, the way it's laid out. Circle K kind of ruined it, but I believe that little lot where Circle K is was separate from the rest of this land, and that's why we have the quagmire that we do. But having said all that, my biggest concern is the height of these structures, the encroachment and the visibility, especially to the people that live on 94th Avenue, and the create and the additional traffic that it's going to create on 95th. Not only with this project, but the one on the southwest corner behind the QT. You're talking 130 plus 130. You can have three or four hundred more cars going up and down 95th and Olive, along with all the school buses, because the school bus garage is right up there at Peoria 95th. Those are my two biggest concerns, folks. And, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not opposed to growth, but, you know, we've got to be sensible about this. They could put a putt, putt golf course there or something, for crying out loud, or, or build a community park and then donate it to Peoria. But, you know, it's, it is what it is. That's all I have to say. Thank you, David. Uh, next speaker request form is from Linda Khan Shockley. Congratulations, you said the last name correct. <laughs> My name's Linda Khan Shockley. I live at 9070 North 94th Avenue. Yes, I am their button right up next to me. Lots of concerns. I've been there since 1985. June 1985. So I've been there for 37 years this month. Lots of changes. One thing I would give up would be my privacy. I value my privacy very, very much. My home is my castle, as everybody else's. I have no privacy in my front yard because that's open to the public. How much privacy do we have in our homes? I've heard of cameras being in televisions and things like that, so, gee, do I go outside for my privacy? <laughs> I don't know anymore. But um, I do value my privacy. And quagmire, that's what I see there, quagmire, 130 units, minimum 260 
more people, maybe 260 more cars. Um, the only way that I have to get out of my place is going down to 93rd Avenue. If I want to go, go west, that's great. If I want to go east, that sucks. So I go down to 95th, so it's safer to go there, but we do have a lot of accidents there also. Um, if there's ever an emergency where we all have to evacuate, oh my God, I only have three exits. 93rd, as I said, and there's only one way to go, and that's west. 95th, and Olive, or 95th and Peoria. Those are the only exits. That's something that should be thought of. Uh, also, people that rent have a different mindset than homeowners. They're transient. They can pick up and leave in a minute. Sure, homeowners can, but what's the likelihood of that? You know, my block wall is going to be the common wall. Well, that's on my property. I did ask the question of who's going to clean up the graffiti if they spray on it. You know, I have a lot of questions, but I just look at it and I go, oh boy, do I sell now quick and give up everything that I've worked for and try and find something else? Or do I stay and then have to put up with a bunch of garbage and BS? Because if teenagers come in there, oh boy, just ask anybody who's living in an apartment complex. What's the stats? Crime goes up. And where are those kids? If there's a lot of kids in there, where are they going to go? They're going to go into the neighborhoods. Over my block wall, possibly. You know, those are my concerns. I'm concerned for my neighbors, too. My neighbors aren't happy about it either. I know they're not here, but some of them work, and it's not like it was when I was younger. Now, people work, and it's, it's hard work, and you know I can understand why they're not here. So, but I am, so I'm speaking my mind, and I'm speaking for them. They don't want to see it, at least all the ones that I've talked to. I haven't heard one that says that they're for it. And I look at the design, the design is right down there on 83rd and Olive. I look and I see 1950s. So how long is that design going to stay in style? I don't know. But we need to think this is South Peoria. I told my granddaughter about my neighbor selling his house. What she said to me is, I'm sorry, Grandma, but it's too ghetto for me. She doesn't live in Peoria. I do. You need to hear it. I'm sorry, you need to hear that. So you can do something about it. Because I'm vested in this community. 87, no, not 37 years I'm vested here. 37 years of property taxes. 37 years of my life. So think about that, please. Thank you, Linda. Last one, David McBucken. Yes, my name is uh, David McMacken. I live on 9419 West Hatchet Road. It's about three blocks north of uh, the proposed thing. Well, you know, my problem always was with traffic, too, and we discussed that, but I'd like to make a suggestion that if you could uh, change this to like a uh, single dwelling, just continue the neighborhood and make more houses, just single dwelling houses. I made a little sketch here, it's not very good, but <laughs> but if you could do that, then maybe he could sell the property because they're building houses all the way up and down Olive Avenue. And my suggestion would be to, uh, where he wants to make this development, it'd be better to have it at 99th Avenue and Olive. Because at 99th Avenue and Olive, this is the, the 99th Avenue that goes south. 99th Avenue zigzags, you guys all know that. But 
there's a piece of land that the back side is the, uh, I think it's the New River Wash, and the other side, the east side, is just open land. I think it's farmland. And then Olive Avenue is just north of the thing. But if, if you could think about having them build it in this area, yeah, I think it would be a good place for that. They'd have a lot more room, and they could probably actually build more apartments. If you'd like to see what I've drawn here, I could show it to you, but, but that's all I really have, had to say. It's just a suggestion. Thank you, Mr. McPack. I appreciate it. <clears throat> you guys are willing to do that? That's all we have for the uh, speaker request form, so I'll close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners, any more questions or comments for staff? Commissioner Waitman. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. I think it, 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 it addressed, I think, concerns, but also what it could bring to the city. Um, a few things that I think, I just think that um, when I was driving um, through Mission Lane and I definitely seen the, the houses, most of them being one story, and I thought about the height of this, this um, you know, this multifamily um, project, I really thought about this. You know, we're talking about the city in the future. We're planning for the future. We're not planning for now. So, you know, I had to come to terms with, you know, just inevitable things. I say no one lives forever. We are planning a city for the future, right? Me being a mommy to be, thinking about some of the commissioners that have children. Um, I think it's wonderful. Me and my husband, we stay here in Peoria, we have a house and it's wonderful. But I do also believe that having some of this diverse housing is necessary for the smart growth of this city if the city wants to grow. Not everybody will be able to, and the truth is, you know, you know, all of us were young, all, all of us were young adults, and all of us need a place to go. Um, I love this city. My husband and I, as, 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 as young, you know, young working professionals, were able to live here, play here, and, you know, we were fortunate enough to have a home here. But if it wasn't the case, then I would be looking for something such as this, right? We're talking about affordability between 15 to 2100, um, approximately. I know those are rough numbers. That's what we're thinking about. And, and, I, and I think it's great that, you know, we have some traffic engineers here. We're talking about things that truly matter, which is we know that if we put two more multifamily properties here, we're going to deal with possibly a multitude of cars. And these are facts, right? But we also cannot, you know, continue as a city to, 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 to look at things you know, I, I think very small, you know, assumptions, maybe assumptions of things that may happen or assumptions that would happen. We know that if we put a, put a building there, a multifamily property there, it's going to have so many tenants. So yes, there would be cars and that is, you know, a, a, a fact. But, you know, based on assumptions, I think this is a wonderful, you know, a wonderful community. And I think that if we want the city to grow smart, to have diverse housing, to grow and to make it a city where young professionals, seasoned individuals, everyone can live and play because we do have homes. We know we have houses here. I think these are the things that we need to see. I think two story is not as, you know, it's not high. If we go and look into different cities, I mean, people are building and, and, and building. I think that um, the uh, developer has been, been you know, have been, has been very much sensitive to, you know, the neighborhood and structuring this and getting something together. So I think it's a wonderful project. Uh, we got to think about the future. We can't think about the now because, you know, um, when it's all said and done, it's about how our city is going to grow. And we possibly, well, we, well, the truth is we won't be here anymore, but we're building it for the city to grow smart. And I think it's wonderful. I think the pricing would just, it would just work. It's a decent, it would be young working professionals, grad students, people that may want to stay close to family. And I think it's a wonderful project and great for our smart growth goals. So those are my comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Waitman. Uh, Commissioner Nelson. Thank you, Chair. Boy, I'm struggling with this one. You know, it just feels like deja vu from our last project where we, we were dealing with a gas station, limited frontage visibility, some of the same things are echoing my head. 
But uh, Mr. Lemke, your comments regarding the access, it makes sense. Um, you know, I would love to see this stay, stay PC1. I think we, as I've said before, I think we throw in the towel too quickly on commercial. But it makes sense. I think that access issue, the visibility on the front of Olive Avenue makes total sense. So um, I, I had a change of heart. You know, when I was interviewed for this position, uh, one of the council members says, what, what advice would you give to others interviewing for this position? And I said, have an, have an open mind. Be willing to change your mind. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing here. I'm flipping from wanting to hold this commercial to being open to rezoning this residential. I can't move off this apartment complex zoning request though. Putting three story apartment complex across from one acre lots next to these single family homes from these people who have invested in this community, stayed in this community as we heard, put roots down in this community. Um, I'm not hearing an outpouring of support for that. And I, I, you know, just I don't judge that there is support by a lack of showing tonight. As I think one of the speakers says, you know, this is a working class neighborhood and people are dealing with kids and, and jobs and dealing with traffic right now. They probably would love to be here. Um, but I don't think I would want to live next to a three story apartment complex. So I'm struggling with that. Can I try to view this from what I would want to live with? So although I'm in support of the general plan amendment change and update to uh, residential, I cannot support an apartment complex. I think I would love to see the owner take this back and shop this around as um, townhomes, single family homes perhaps, um, condos, I, something to that effect. Single story, less density, less traffic on 95th Avenue, less impact on the neighbors, less privacy issues, I can go on and on. But that's where I stand on this, and that's why I'll be voting for the general plan amendment and against the rezoning. Thank you. Commissioner Grice. When, when I look at the general plan, the density across this is less than 12 dwelling units per acre. So I tend to agree, I mean, I absolutely agree that this the commercial potential of this site is flown the coop, it's gone. This is not viable as commercial. It what needs to go to some type of residential. I disagree about the density of it going to 12 plus dwelling units per acre. I believe it should be less than the 12 dwelling units per acre. And I'm gonna vote against the general plan amendment for that reason because the density needs to be adjust, addressed at the general plan level, I believe. Commissioner Hutchinson. Hmm. Thanks, Chair. Um, another one of those interesting meetings again. Um, <laughs> look, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the valley area as a whole, um, it was just reported we are a quarter million home units away from where we should be. Um, the, the future of our area, it's unfortunately, we can't build out anymore. We have to build up. And we're going to be seeing more and more of these, and they're needed. I have three kids that can't find a place to live. We need more res resident multifamily housing units throughout the city. To have an infill project like this and open up the opportunity for commuters to get right onto the 101, working families, single, you know, single and, and young couples that, that can afford a place to live and get to work, you know, get onto the 101 and go to work. We don't have enough of that. And these infill projects are a perfect fit for the location that, that it's in. I know it's, I know it's a tough change to adopt to for the, for the residential neighbors that were right there, but you know, you've had 30 years with nothing there. And you, you had you appreciate the time that you had there because they're apartments. It doesn't make them bad people and, and doesn't make graffiti happen on your wall. Doesn't make kids crawl through your yard or whatever. It, none of that stuff. Those are all perceptions. And the reality of it is we're a quarter million housing units short of where we need to be right now with the growth of this valley, the businesses, the, the industries that are moving in and the opportunities for young people to, to get out there, make it, and just find a place to live, it's damn near impossible. We need more of this, and I'm, I'm in support of both the zoning and for the, uh, and for the project on its own, so. Um, 
sorry, let me look at Commissioner Nelson. Did you request again? I didn't. I apologize. I okay. Yeah. Any other commissioners? Thank you all for your comments. I appreciate everybody's input. Um, I've been back and forth like Commissioner Nelson, and ultimately I, I've fallen on the same lines that Commissioner Hutchinson has. Uh, we're in a housing crisis, and for that reason, and almost that reason alone, I'll be supporting both cases. Um, I, I, I think that's all I have to say about that. Do we have a, a motion? Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve uh, GPA 21-04, the Modern Park West General Plan Amendment for approval to City Council. Commissioner Waitman, I second. Can I ask a, can I, oh. would I be appropriate to ask a quick question? Sure. So I wanna make sure, maybe I'm gonna send this one to our attorney here. So it's a, this item 3R, if we vote in favor of the minor general plan amendment, we are voting in favor of Defining the zoning at 12 plus dwelling units, turning that, uh, help me understand what exactly, I want to make sure that I'm voting correctly and accurately here. So are we, we're approving changing that to urban residential 12 plus dwelling units per acre designation for, on the general plan, correct? Uh, uh, Commissioner, that is, that is correct. That's the okay. proposal in front of you. And so when we okay. um, look at rezones uh, under state statute, the rezone has to be in conformance with the general plan. So right, yeah. uh, that is the request, 12 plus units to uh, match with their density that they're proposing under the zoning case. Got it, okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Um, we had a second. Um, I think we're okay to take a vote. Motion uh, passes uh, with uh, one nay. Thank you for your vote. Uh, commissioners, do we have a motion for item 4R? Mr. Chair, I'll, uh, I'll move um, to recommend uh, approval to the City Council on item 4R, um, Z2107. I'll second. Thank you. Please vote. And motion passes four to two. Thank you. Uh, we'll proceed to item 5R, noticing procedures, uh, text amendment. Staff, please present your report. One second while we switch out staff, but you'll recall several months ago we came in front of the commission and we held a study session and talked about uh, some of the enhanced notification procedures that we're looking at. So tonight, I'm going to introduce Dan Seimer back. Now the Chris show is over tonight. Good evening, Chair, members of the commission. Dan Seimer, senior planner with the city. As Chris indicated, we were back before you in March to do a uh, study session, work session on this item. Uh, we went through both our current um, noticing procedures and providing an uh, in-depth overview of those. And this amendment is to enact a lot of the stuff that we talked about. Um, so I'll briefly go through those for you. So the request before you is a zoning code tax amendment. It does aff uh, affect three sections of the code. The first section is our noticing requirements, the second is the rezoning, and the third is the site plan. And that has to do with each one of those sections has uh, noticing provisions. So the purpose of the amendment is to provide a greater level of opportunity to the public to get information earlier. And we'll kind of touch on that as we go through there. Uh, identify best practices for our open um, remote meetings. Now that'll be done through a guide that's not part of this amendment. So that'll be a guide that will be published after the approval and adoption of the ordinance if so council decides and finally the we'll be uh, making these modifications to the current requirements we're just changing those requirements um, and modifying them in a way that is minimal cost to the development community so as we as we go through the process the 
the uh, graphic on the screen before you is a real general overview of our process. So there's many steps in that, but those are our big steps. So you got your general plan, your zoning, uh, you got your site plan and pre-plat approvals and your construction documents. Through the general plan, through all the way to the site plan pre-plat, we do a notice of application and public hearing notices for those first two, the general plan and the zoning, and then we just do a site plan and pre-plat notification to the public. And it varies by the type of application, general plans and rezoning go out to 600 feet unless they're over um, 40 acres and then it goes up to 12, uh, 1,320 feet, if I remember correctly. Uh, we do notify all the HOAs within a mile for all three types. The site plan and the pre-plat are notified of the 300 feet. And of course, when construction documents go through, those are, there's no notification on those, but the public is notified when the pre-plat and the site plan has been approved. So the forms of notification that we have, we have the notice of application, and these are for your general plan, your rezoning, your conditional use permits, your site plan, and your, and your preliminary plat. This is a notice card that goes out, and we showed those to you last time, and they're on the screen before you, that we send out to the property owners to know, hey, there's an application that's been submitted. For the public hearing applications, and that's any application that comes before you, whether it's a rezoning, general plan amendment, conditional use permit, including also some appeals. But primarily, the notice of neighborhood meeting, this is sent by the applicant, and this is a letter that goes out uh, regarding their open house meeting or neighborhood meeting. The city does follow up those public hearings with a postcard. For example, the case that you just heard, a notice would have went out for those to uh, 600 feet. Um, in accordance with state statute, we do do a legal, or we call it a legal ad, and it's because we call it a legal ad because it's in a state statute. It's in the newspaper, it's an eighth page ad article that is published, and it goes out a minimum 15 days ahead of time. For those public hearing cases, there is a sign posting that you can see the zoning sign kind of on the screen before you. We will be modifying those, I'll kind of hit on that in a brief second. And then for our site plan and our, and we'll be proposing a change to our preliminary plat, uh, we send out a notice of decision so that the public knows that the cases have been approved. So the proposed changes. Currently, we have the, we notify all of our public hearing cases with the many different types of applications that you see before there and with the process that I identified earlier uh, I want to make a note that the general plan application is referenced by, is incorporated by reference. So currently, we follow the zoning application process for those type of applications, but it's not specifically stated. So we will be specifically stating the, the general plan application. But more importantly, we're going to be adding the specific plan areas, and those are like our old town master uh, specific plan. And there's some others up in Vistancia as well, or near there. Uh, as it pertains to the different types of applications, we talked about the site plan and preliminary plat. Currently, those get a notice of application, and depending if it was appealed, the different type of notifications, but they all get a notice of decision. The preliminary plat does not follow that currently, and we're going to be modifying that application process to mirror those uh, site plans, and that is so that our administrative approval applications are consistent. As it pertains to our site postings, currently we post for all the public hearings. There are different types of signs, but the primary one that you see is your four by eight sign, and those go out for public hearing. We're gonna be changing that process as part of this amendment so that those signs go out prior to the neighborhood meeting, and the content of the sign, which will be part of our guide, will have that information about the neighborhood meeting in it. So that's a, a process improvement. Currently, there's not a sign posted for the neighborhood meeting. These signs will be posted before then. They still have to post a sign, so it's just earlier. No, no real significant additional cost. Uh, we're we're going to be modifying the content as part of the guide to make sure they're clear. Uh, 
and as I indicated, they're 15 days before. Now, one of the things we're clarifying, and this is unique to Peoria, I'm not familiar with any other city that does this, we're gonna be modifying our code to state that the sign date that is posted, the neighborhood meeting, and the public hearing are not included in that 15 days. And the reason is, is to make sure that sign is up 15 days prior to the hearing. Um, I can tell you, through my 24 years of doing this, I can't tell you how many times I get a, a, a very late night photo that's taken in the dark. So you get it maybe a couple hours before midnight, it goes up, that counts as a day. Well, we're gonna, this will no longer allow that. So it's up for 15 days prior to the neighborhood meeting. And then when the public hearings notice th that sign will get updated with the hearing and that date isn't counted and then it'll be a updated 15 days before the hearing. So the idea is to make sure there's a full 15 days. Furthermore, we're updating that the zoning minister may request additional signage. And the criteria for that is if it's over 40 acres or over 10 acres, sorry. Um, and if it's on multiple street frontages uh, or if there's a need to provide additional sign areas so we're not cramming all the text onto one sign you know, making it smaller and harder to read. So it's the idea is to make sure we get the information out uh, and that, that there's sufficient signs. And finally, which is, isn't in our code, and it, we, we've all drove around going, wow, I heard that case four months ago and that sign's still there. Uh, we're adding the provision that the signs must be down 14 days after final action. So that'll allow us to get that, those signs down and if necessary, um, do a court enforcement action. Normally when we notify them, hey, can you please take down the sign? They will. Occasionally they drag their feet, but the idea is get this sign down. So, and that's to eliminate visual clutter. That's no longer ne necessary. Now our proposed neighborhood meetings, currently um, the notices go out 10 days before a neighborhood meeting. We're gonna be changing that to the 15 days to follow the same criteria. I just talked to you about the signs. And the idea is so that we're mirroring the public hearing time frames, that, that, that all that information is minimum 15 days. And we're also asking that the neighborhood meeting is done after staff's first review of the application. Why are we doing that? Well, the intent of that is so that the public sees the revisions or at least the applicant is aware of staff's comments before doing an open house meeting. Very often what happens is you may have heard this and it's other application. I've never seen this before. Well, it, it, they may have seen it, but in a whole different form. So the idea is that they, the applicant has the time to make any modifications or is aware of the staff's comments. Uh, uh, in a rare case that an application does not require a subsequent review, it does have to be, will have to be done before we uh, schedule a public hearing. So you still get that process in place. And, um, it's again to get the most accurate and current information out to the public. So as we as we move through the process, we're also gonna allow, as we went through COVID, we learned about the electronic meetings and how to do that. We're gonna be adding a provision that allows the zoning administrator to either allow or require that uh, electronic meeting. And we'll be establishing uh, minimum uh, policy guides for that. And you know, most of the time what that comes down to is you're using a, an application that's known to everyone, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, how the meetings run, how the comments are talked about. Those are policy guides, they're not code requirements. The code just says you need to comply with it. So that gives us the requirements that we need. And finally, the as we noticed that the, the notices that go out, all too often the information that we need that the public needs to know is when, where, and what is it get lost. So we're gonna be having minimum standards for that and also in our guides we'll be establishing those too. So as I indicated earlier that the, the and just now, the policy updates, we'll be updating our sign requirements to be more clear, more precise. We'll be updating or creating a neighborhood open house guide to create the template, which I just talked to you about, and the virtual meeting Currently, we're doing this already. We've updated our city website, so when there's a neighborhood meeting and a public meeting, our planning commission, city council, that information is available on the website now. 
So when we get notified as, as the project coordinator, we uh, send it off to the people that update that and that information is available on the website. So there's multiple forms. Your notice goes out earlier, it's more clear, your sign goes up, you have your electronic notification as well. So we've done the public outreach, we've met with you again in March, we talked about what it is and what we're planning to do. We've also talked with the city council, had a meeting on that. The public hearing, this public hearing, in addition to the city council, was uh, published in the newspaper in accordance with the zoning code and state statute. And as of right now, we have not received any support or opposition to this application. Noticing did go out to, the, uh, was also sent out to the business community that we keep track of with our uh, economic vitality staff. So there was a much larger notification that went out. And I believe that's 5,000 people on it. Yeah, yeah, 5,000 people on it. So we've hit a very broad uh, spectrum as it pertains to this amendment. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Oh, wait a minute, I got one more, findings. <laughs> Forgot about the findings. So the purpose of it is to enhance our notification requirements at, while minimal impact to development costs and enhance, uh, get that information out there earlier. Uh, the primary comp accomplishment is where, when and where's your, no, your neighborhood meeting? Get that information out. Ensure that the signs, uh, the signs and the notices comply with our guides. Broaden the participation and expanding the platforms, which is our electronic review. Uh, electronic notification, our, our notices on the website, uh, doing a notice of approval or decision, that's what we call them for preliminary plats, which currently isn't done, and then requiring the notice, uh, the signs be removed in 14 days, and finally re uh, removing any redundancies, consolidating information. As you can see in your packet, the current code is 10 pages long to say the same thing what we just did in five. So. I'll be happy to answer any questions at your time. Staff is recommending approval. And I'll hear the answer. Sure. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have a couple of questions from commissioners. I'll start with Commissioner Waitman. Thank you, Chair. Quick question, and I just missed this because I know you went over this. When we were discussing the site postings, there were some amendments that were going to be made so that the lettering would be small and all on one side. What were those amendments that were going to be made to the site postings? Because last week I went um, to one of the sites, and the issue for me was that I had to park across the street mm -hmm. at the church because the, 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 the site posting was posted, but there was no way to pull off you know, 90, 95th or to pull to the side. So I had to get out because all the letters were kind of crammed upon each other. There was not a lot of red lettering or anything that popped out. I really had to get a, get out and walk to, to that side of the road to find out. So what were the amendments that were going to be made to the site postings? Sure, the policy amendments that we're looking at is we're gonna be obviously not trying to get as much information on the, fly, on the signs. It'll be what's the applications for, who's the contact information, the staff contact information, again, what the application is for. Where it's located, we're gonna have a location map, and I'll have the neighborhood meetings, uh, times and dates and locations, and the city council and planning commission meetings. The minimum letter uh, font is one inch. Okay. Um, to make it larger, we have to start taking stuff off. Because one of the things when you start make, when you, the more white space, easier to read or like the sign that was I, we saw earlier that was on the thing it's very cramped very hard to read yes so we're going to be minimizing the amount of jargon on the sign and of course you did mention last time about changing that dates to the red well we'll be implementing that too yeah i think so i think it's great i love the site the site postings but definitely just if you don't want to get out of the car or are not as interested but you're just driving past there i just think being able to have a sign that's legible when, when you're moving, I think that would help. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Nelson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I love the proposal. Anytime we can be more transparent, give more notice to our residents to participate, that encourages participation, that's a good thing. So this is all uh, moving in the right direction, in my opinion. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, you mentioned there was a city council study session on this. Right. I'm just curious if you could summarize what was city council's feedback on this. I'm just kidding. Would you want to? Yep. 
uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, I, I could certainly do that. I, I delivered that presentation. The uh, City Council was very supportive of the amendment. Uh, they thought these were all sensible, good changes, and these were changes that did not elongate the development process time, did not add additional cost. Again, as uh, Mr. Simon mentioned, we already require the site posting to go up. This just requires it to go up a little earlier. And I think we, we made some other things that hopefully clarify things and, and uh, just make it a little more clear for people. Great. Excellent. Uh, the other question I have, if I may, is can you clarify the electronic virtual neighborhood meetings? Is, or would these be in addition to the in-person meetings or in lieu of or in place of those meetings? The, the way the code is written and proposed is that the zoning administrator has the ability to require in addition to the neighborhood meeting or in place of. So the intent is how do, what is going to be the best way to get the public notification out. Um, certain times, there, you know, we're in the middle of nowhere. It may be more appropriate to do an electronic meeting. Who knows? But the, the, the intent is it gives the zoning administrator the option, although our intent is not to do away with the neighborhood meeting. That's a last resort okay. kind, of, kind of option. Thank you. And the zoning administrator is Mr. Hawkins, correct? Okay. I thought I heard commissioner, and I was like, mm. <laughs> then I heard administrator. That was good. Um, I uh, had an additional question. Uh, I'll let Commissioner Hutchinson go first. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I know I mentioned it last time, and I don't know if it was. I, I just paid my utility bill with my phone just now as we were talking. And uh, I mean, I know the utility has the ability to see, you know, my address and my cell phone. I mean, wouldn't it be that just the tracking and to be able to say, no, we sent you a notice and here's the proof? Uh, that, you know, when people say I didn't get the notice or I wasn't informed or whatnot, I mean, this is attached to my address. And I got a text, you know, I paid my bill right now. I just did it paid. But uh, I don't know, it just seems like we have, it would not only benefit the resident, it would benefit you guys and all of us to say, look, we, we, we informed you, here's the proof, documented proof. Not just, we, we, we sent you a card. I would be throwing those cards in them. If I said, dear resident, right in the garbage. <laughs> I want to see my name on it. No. Anyway, that's just my comment. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Nelson, uh, Hutchinson, um, actually, ironically, I had the same question today, and it was a neighbor who reached out to us approximately six months after a rezoning case that had been completed and construction was getting ready to start out of the out of the ground, so to speak. And so um, what we currently do is every application that we have a notice, we create a radius list. It's an Excel spreadsheet on record that we have. We also include a map of all the addresses that we have. We, um, because of ARS regulations, it has to be out to first class mail from a city perspective. And so we are not able, so we're supplementing through electronic means, but that to meet state law, we have to have first class mail. And so we keep a record of that. And so as Jack goes, I, Jack, Jack C2, which you met at the last meeting, goes, I have an angry neighbor, and he said he never got noticed. And I was able to pull up that notification list, and I said he was noticed um, for the general plan and zoning case. He actually was noticed also for the site plan case. So he had two bites of the apple, so to speak. He also had his homeowners association receive notice as well and could have communicated that out to him. So we were able to provide that documentation. Um, whether he received the card or not, um, we try our best. And if for some reason they have not adequately modified their mailing address, not necessarily with county, but it's with the tax assessor location as well. Sometimes we have that difference in there. Or if they've let a forwarding address lapse, we get a lot of postcards kicked back and it's, it is a shame and we keep a good stack of those until the case is over and things go. Um, but we still always have that record of what, who we sent to, when we sent to, and so forth. And, and today, actually, that was a, a great, yes, we did, promise we did, you know, you, you did have that opportunity. So to your point, Commissioner Hutchinson, um, we make every effort um, until state law changes, we, we're we're supplementing as best as possible. 
Yeah, I know they still require newspaper. Um, read so sorry to the newspaper people. Yeah, just uh, for some perspective, APS has all the same challenges the city has. Um, some projects we send out 30,000 notifications and we get three people showing up to meetings. Um, when we do a virtual meeting, we might get 100 people showing up. So our experience has been we do both. Uh, we're required to do the mailers, but the virtual meetings have actually gotten much, much more traction um, than the in-person meetings. Uh, so I fully support having that as an option. I did have a question, maybe I heard incorrectly. Can you elaborate on the change for the preliminary plat approvals? Is there a hearing for that or is that still done administratively? Chair, uh, members of the commission, the preliminary plat currently just gets a notice of application. Uh, what we're changing is that when the pre preliminary plat's approved, we will send that notice. The only time it goes to the commission is if there's an appeal. Okay, I got you. Thank you. I, so the other reason I asked, surprise, just surprise, tried to remove the preliminary plat hearing and it actually got declined, which I thought was interesting. And I thought we were going in the opposite direction. I'm fully supportive of a preliminary plat administrative approvals. That makes a lot more sense to me. It's a technical document. Yeah, and Mr. Chair, uh, members of the commission, the preliminary plat is an administrative document in the, in the city of Peoria, like site plans. So what we're trying to do is make the two consistent in how we not notify them. Right now in our code, there is uh, very little language in regards to preliminary plats. So we're trying to make that in alignment with how we treat site plans. They're both administrative applications. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, any other comments? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Uh, Chairman, I move that we recommend approval of case TA22-01 pursuant, pursuant to exhibit three contained therein. Do have a second? Second. Thank you, please vote. Motion passes unanimously, thank you. All right, we'll proceed to uh, call to the public on any non-agenda items, seeing none present. Uh, we'll proceed to 6R, reports from staff. Mr. Chairman, I have the honors this evening. So um, as a summer bonus upcoming meetings, we do not have any scheduled items June 16th or the July 7th meeting for commission. So we do invite you back July 21st so please have a safe and happy 4th of July, and we will see you shortly thereafter. That's all that we have. Sorry, adding that on my phone. Uh, Got to close out the meeting. Oh, do we have any uh, updates from commission? I'd just like to thank Mr. Hawkins for spending his birthday evening with us tonight. So happy, happy birthday. All right. <laughs> so we, we hope your party was as enjoyable as it was for us. Happy Absolutely. birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> 29 happy feels birthday. great, huh? All right. Uh, see no other updates. We'll close this meeting. Thank you.